hi there, friends. My name is Eli, and I am one of the volunteers of TechSoup Connect Western Canada. I, I also have my co-organizer, Ben Abel, here as well. We are all connected in with TechSoup, which is a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get access to technology, find the right consultants, and generally do fun things with tech. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about feasibility studies and how we can use them to increase project success by doing the, the early work, the preliminary evaluation. Basically, if you skip that part of work, you're probably going to throw away some time, some money, and some energy. And so we're going to talk today about how you can do that proper due diligence to make sure you're working effectively and efficiently. To do that, we've got a guest presenter here with us. We've got Alida who, Horsley, who is the research and design lead over at Tandem Studios. And Ali is an award-winning user experience researcher and designer with nearly 10 years of experience with Canada's most prolific media institutions and startups. As a problem solver, Ali works directly with stakeholders, teams, and users to support business needs and nonprofit needs to find crucial insights Let's dive right in so we can learn a little bit more about what a feasibility study is and how it can make your life a little bit better. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to be here. I'm Alida Horsley, pronouns with they them. I'm a user experience designer and researcher at Tandem Studios. People are often unfamiliar with what user experience design is, also known as UX design. UX design ensures things, in this case projects, are made to work for people. Because if something is made without people in mind, it's not going to be successful. I work to ensure that end users, teams, and businesses are supported in successfully reaching their goals. Does the project recognize how the users think? Does it support their goals and needs? Operationally, does the team have the tools and process they need to complete a project? And business vision, does this project align with the business's goals? Because success from the UX design perspective means a project is created to make the best use of both a business's and end users' time, effort, and money. So let's get into feasibility studies. There's two main sections of what we're going to be covering today. That's what are feasibility studies and the steps to creating a feasibility study. So like Yuli said, please type any questions that you have about feasibility studies or UX or really anything in the chat, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So just a quick note on the term end user, uh, just in case it's unfamiliar to some people, end users are people who will ultimately benefit from your project. An example might be if your team is creating a neighborhood coffee get together for seniors, the end users are local seniors who are combating social isolation. So getting into the meat, what are feasibility studies? Feasibility studies are the holistic evaluation of whether your team has the ability to successfully implement a project and whether the evaluated return of investment is worth the initial investment. So the definition of return of investment is very flexible. It can be from money to quality of life improvements for end users. Our goal with the feasibility study is to give stakeholders the information they need to make the decision of whether a project will go ahead or not. So I have a few common examples of why you would conduct a feasibility study. Uh, Signe Madden, uh, she is the executive director of United Way Central and Northern Vancouver Island. She was kind enough to share some stories to flesh out these examples from a nonprofit perspective. Our first example on the left is if you are making a change, a big change, but you're not sure how it's going to affect your business. Signe gave it a great example of when a feasibility study should have been done. When the BC Liberal Party rebranded to become the BC United, the United Way's social media channel started getting a huge uptick of negative comments. Turns out that people are getting BC United and United Way BC confused. United Way BC is a nonprofit. It's well known and it has existed for over 100 years. A feasibility study would have likely let BC United, previously known as the Liberal Party, 
know how difficult competing with that kind of brand recognition would be. So our second example in the middle, your team wants to do a new type of project that your team has never done before. These projects are large, complex, and expensive where it's critical to understand all of the moving parts in order to be successful. Another example Sydney gave me concerned the city of Nanaimo's art gallery. Her team is conducting a feasibility study to understand how other cities have sought out more space and funding. And her third and final example on the right, times when feasibility studies would be useful are projects with history. These are projects that have faced issues or failure. Issues definitely happen, especially in work that has a great deal of social nuance. Feasibility studies can help your team pivot towards a better direction. United Way put funding aside for a subset of nonprofits, but no one was applying for the funding. United Way did a feasibility study and found that these nonprofit groups were so overwhelmed, they didn't have time to fill out complex paperwork required to apply for the funding. United Way found the best way to distribute these specific resources was to fill out the paperwork themselves over the phone. Taking on the effort to get the information so these nonprofit groups could get access to the necessary funding. So what's evaluated in a feasibility study? Here you'll find a wide range of topics that can go into making a feasibility study. No matter the size of the study, the important thing is that you pursue the areas that you have the most unknowns or provide the most value for your project. It's also important to consider experience. For example, if your team isn't the most technologically proficient, doing a technical evaluation is going to take more research and time than budget. So let's quickly go through these sections on the screen here. Business operations. This is conducting business resources are considering business resources and how they're going to be used on this project. That's staffing, project timelines, as well as project process, business policies, and legal considerations that intersect with the project. Next is business strategy. This is understanding business direction, specifically goals and differentiation. It's understanding what a successful project looks like to the business. Then relationship mapping. This is understanding which stakeholders would be affected by the project you're going to do. It's gauging stakeholder opinion on the project to understand how they could champion the project or potentially mediate any issues a stakeholder could have with the project. Then user experience. This is understanding the motivations and goals of the end users, stakeholders, and team. Projects aren't often successful if these groups aren't taken into consideration. Project history it is discovering the motivations behind this project and the efforts that have previously been made to make this project happen. Technical resources is tallying and evaluating available tools to ensure that you have enough to complete your project. Financial resources is quantifying the cost of the project and seeing whether the project's benefits are worth the cost. Integration is understanding how this project fits within an existing operational system, community, infrastructure, etc. And finally, market and brand. This is identifying the demand for your project and anticipating how it may affect your brand. So why would you want to conduct a feasibility study? Firstly, to minimize risk. Feasibility studies can help you identify challenges, issues, or gaps in knowledge before they become costly problems. To also reduce bias, feasibility studies confirm if the project opportunity is available and achievable. Challenging bias through research is one of the best ways to combat gut decisions. It also helps you improve decision-making. Research helps your team know what parts of the project take priority or which elements cost the most time and money. A large part of feasibility studies is working to understand the end users and stakeholder perspective. Doing this early in the project process demonstrates that you're invested in the project, that you care about their perspectives and expertise and are open to feedback, which creates deeper partnerships within communities. 
And finally, feasibility studies improve operational efficiency. Getting a holistic perspective of your business's processes and resources often uncovers ways to improve efficiencies, decrease overlap, lower operating costs, and overall increase productivity. So a big myth that we often come across when it comes to feasibility studies is the belief that project budgets are best spent on action, not research. There are cases when this is true. For example, if your team is already very successful with a type of project or cases when the project budget is extremely low. The big risk is what we call failed project debt. Here's an example. We had a client who asked us to help them find the right accounting software. They had the misfortune to be switching to their third accounting software in three years, and they were at a breaking point. Half of the team was using the old software, while the other half was using a cobbled together solution, which was wasting a lot of resources. The majority of the team was frustrated with the situation, discouraged that they would have to learn yet another accounting software and distrustful of any proposed software solutions. We call it debt because every repeat failure magnifies the issues, creating a huge sink for resources and increases the difficulty of future attempts. And definitely failure happens, but on the flip side, feasibility studies can minimize or negate the amount of damage failure creates, gives you the information to properly take accountability for failure, and ensures you can resolve the issues from failure faster and more effectively. So there's also a large opportunity when it comes to conducting feasibility studies. They can be an excellent way to build a relationship with new clients, getting more buy-in and frankly, more money. Now, I definitely appreciate that this may not be available to every nonprofit or for every project, but here's an example. The business that I work for Tandem had this issue. Software projects are often large, expensive, and involve working closely with their clients for a sustained amount of time. That's asking a lot from a new client. They don't know whether we're worth the money or frankly, if we're enjoyable to work with. Now, nowadays, we always start projects with a feasibility study. Instead of signing a contract for X amount, we do a study for X amount. We're building trust, going from a small project into a larger project. Since clients are more trusting of us, they're therefore easier to deal with. Often clients sign on for larger projects before we even finish the feasibility study. And in our case, if a client gives a lot of pushback on conducting a feasibility study for an especially complex project, it's a good indication that they're not taking the project seriously and they're not a good client fit for us. Okay, so let's get into the basics of conducting a feasibility study. When do you conduct a feasibility study? If the project hasn't started, you want to start when you have a rough or semi-rough project outline. The major concepts are roughed in, but the resource ex execution planning hasn't started. I wouldn't recommend going any farther in the planning because the information you'll find during your feasibility study will impact any planning that you do there. Now, if the project is ongoing, it can be really difficult, but when major questions and concerns arise, often the best thing to do is to halt the project and if possible, divert some res resources towards feasibility studies. What's important to avoid here is what's called the sunk cost fallacy. That's the belief that we made it this far, we may as well keep going. Some ways you can challenge this sunk cost fallacy is by evaluating your evidence, listing out the project's pros and cons, and asking yourself, is the return investment still worth the effort necessary to complete the project? Next, you would evaluate your project goals, asking yourself, would a stakeholder or end user think the goals are worthwhile? And then are the steps the team is taking effectively push the project towards these goals? And then finally, evaluating proposed solutions to project issues. 
asking yourself, are stakeholders, the team, and end users happy with the proposed solutions or issues? Or are the solutions that are coming up quick and temporary fixes? If these questions are difficult to answer, it's best to stop the project and wait. All right, so who conducts the study? Overall, it takes a team of one to five people to create a feasibility study. One person can do it, but it takes a wide variety of skills. We know nonprofit teams wear a lot of hats, but we still broke it down into three main roles. First are the researchers. They collect the information and conduct the interviews. They're detail-oriented, analytical, and organized. It's good to consider that the people being interviewed feel comfortable sharing information with researchers because interviews can get into sensitive topics. So for example, the boss probably shouldn't be in interviewing employees about employee satisfaction with leadership. You can't really expect open feedback. If available, it's often effective to have someone unestablished with the business or community conduct the study. That's often why businesses bring contractors like us in to conduct studies for their businesses. People are more likely to be open with us. So next are the writers. Writers synthesize the information into major concepts and create the report that stakeholders will identify with. And finally, the presenter. The presenter delivers an overview of the feasibility report to stakeholders. Ideally, you want someone that the stakeholders will trust and listen to. All right. So now we're getting into the steps of creating a feasibility study. First, you're going to want to plan the feasibility study. Uh, it can be pretty general, but you start with your project goals. What is the project attempting to achieve the project you're studying? Then get into end users. Who are the project's end users and which specific people or demographic of people will you be interviewing? After that, it's stakeholders. Who are the project stakeholders and which specific people or demographic people will you be interviewing? Next is the research disciplines, which are the areas of the project you're going to focus on. This is the list that we talked about earlier in the presentation concerning business operations, relationship mapping etc. Next is resourcing. That's who is going to be working on the study and what role they'll be taking on. And finally, operational, just understanding the study schedule, budget, and team resourcing. Step two of the study is collecting applicable information. Basically, you're trying your best to not repeat work and find out what's already known. Ask stakeholders and project leadership what project information has been collected. Do we have financials, a list of available tools and technology, etc.? Has any other kind of study on a similar topic been done? Now, if you gather any subjective information, it's a really good idea to consider that it could be biased. The feasibility study is a great way to verify that information with other sources. Step three is getting buy-in, specifically from stakeholders end users, and ground-level staff who aren't at the center of the project decision-making process. It's getting the information necessary for a feasibility study, which hinges on the cooperation of these groups. People who don't understand the point of a feasibility study or who feel threatened by the study can give poor feedback and non-participation. It's understandable. People have to feel invested in order to want to participate. A really straightforward way to gain buy-in is to do a quick presentation explaining the feasibility study to the different groups, covering what the study is about, why the study is being conducted, who it benefits, who is affected by the study, who is going to be ideally involved with the study schedule, how long it will take and when it will start, and also providing open space for questions. We want to make sure that this is an open forum. So step four, interviews. This is what I'd say is the crucial part of the feasibility study. This is sitting down with individuals or groups of people and asking them a pre-prepared list of questions. Interviews may be intimidating, but without interviews, you're only getting a fraction of the picture. We're gonna cover the three basic types of interviews. 
The first type are stakeholder interviews. That's interviewing the people who are paying for the project and are deciding whether the project goes ahead or not. You want to interview at least one person, but ideally you'd inter interview all of your stakeholders, but we would recommend not interviewing more than five people because that just takes a lot of time and it's a lot of information to cover. Some of the things you're trying to figure out during stakeholder interviews are what part of the project do they feel comfortable about? What are they concerned about? What do they know about the end users? How do they see themselves, their competitive advantage and differentiation? What are their short-term and long-term goals? And what is their availability and level of engagement with the feasibility study? Asking that last question is a good way to understand their buy-in, how bought in they are. The next type of interview are staff and support interviews. This is interviewing the people who will be making the project happen, who work more closely with the end users and know the reality of end user behavior, goals, and challenges. You want to interview at least two people from this group. Ideally, you would interview people from each of the major project groups, up to 10 people, no more than that. With staff and support interviews, we're asking almost the same questions as with the stakeholders except we're adding some pointed questions to get nuanced about the information stake stakeholders have given you. Frankly, it's important to check and validate the stake stakeholder perspective because stakeholders are often as involved with the day-to-day -day workings and may not always have an accurate perspective. Finally, we have end user interviews. These are the main people who will be affected by or make use of the outcome of the project. You'd want to interview at least three people, but ideally 10, but no more than 10. With end user interviews, we're looking to learn about their general attitudes, how they think about a problem, strong impressions, beliefs, mental models, and experiences. Now, which interview type would be best to prioritize if you're dealing with a limited budget? If you can only do one, I'd recommend the stakeholder interview. Stakeholders can give you the widest amount of information from the business perspective down to the end user. After that, in order of priority, it would be the end user interviews and then the staff and support interviews. Interviewers listen, they don't give their own perspectives. It's normal to want to respond to interviewees, but it's important to give them the open floor to get all of their thoughts and perspectives out. Rather than giving your perspective, try to give a follow-up question. Validate your evidence. Bias is sneaky. I've talked about bias a lot in this presentation. It's just important to remember, just because one person gives you feedback that feels true, doesn't mean it gets the whole picture. Sometimes people don't want to admit when they don't have an answer to your question, and they'll give you a top-of-the-head opinion. They're just trying to be helpful. Don't get people to answer imagine if or what if questions. You're getting pure speculation, not real information. Record your interviews. Don't take notes. We use Otter AI to transcribe and record our interviews. It means we can pay attention and ask better follow-up questions. These next two are interrelated. They don't provide stakeholders with the interview transcription. Interviewees deserve the comfort of anonymity. It's important to reassure interviewees that what they're saying is anonymous and you'll only contact them to ask for permission to use their quotes. And finally, pay interviewees for their experience and their expertise. Their perspective is extremely valuable, and this is especially true when it comes to end users. Their time and expertise is worth something, so value it by giving you token gifts like cash or a gift card. Some feasibility studies necessitate intermediate or more in-depth research. I've listed out some common UX research methods that I think could be beneficial for feasibility studies in the nonprofit community. If you'd like to learn more about these, I have some resources at the end of the presentation and feel free to ask any questions. All right, so we are on the final step of creating your feasibility study, creating the report. I've listed on this slide the most common sections you'll find within feasibility reports. It's the first section of your report, and you want to make the section count. 
Sometimes it's the only section that major stakeholders read. Make it impactful and make the critical information stand out. And finally, our key takeaways from this whole presentation. Why do we do feasibility studies? We do them to reduce the risk of failed project debt, to build trust with new clients, which can be an opportunity to make more money, to enhance decision-making, to achieve end-user and stakeholder buy-in, improve operational efficiency, and minimize bias. That's it. Thank you so much for listening to me, and thank you, Texan, for the opportunity to present. I think it's time for questions now. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Really grateful for that overview and some really tangible information like these are the kinds of questions or how you should approach the interview or these are the key sections that you should consider when you're putting together your report. So that's super helpful. And the slides and some of these key links and resources will be shared with everyone in the next couple of days. So you'll make sure we have that available to you. But now we have some time for a bit of, of Q&A. Um, if you're feeling a little bashful, just throw something into the chat and I'm happy to read it on your behalf. If you're feeling a little bit less bashful, you can also, of course, come on camera and, and do it up with us and get in the mix. Both of those are totally open to you. This is your chance to ask a couple of questions, go a little bit deeper into this, and we can go through and figure out how should we approach this? Let me start with the first question I've got that comes here in the chat, and it comes from Alex. And he says, like, when in this process would you send questionnaires via email? So when you're trying to collect feedback from people, is there a, a, a natural place for that? Yeah, absolutely. You plan out your feasibility study, you do your stakeholder interviews or the round of interviews. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, you would do additional methods of research. So sending out, maybe instead of sitting down with end users, you send out a survey. That would be the perfect time to do that. So I've got another question, which is, is there any good examples of these evaluation studies, feasibility studies that you might point to us to say, here's something that you should look to for inspiration. Like where might we look for something like that? Oh, absolutely. I know it comes top of the line because I was just talking to someone from United Way, but I believe that they do sometimes publish their feasibility studies. Mm, basically, yeah, right. it would be, they would come out as either a white paper, mm -hmm. a research paper. So I'm sure if you search nonprofit white paper or, or something similar to that, you'll find examples of exactly what we're talking about here today. That's super interesting, especially in United Ways as this chapterized organization have their own conferences and really do a lot of that intranetwork sharing. Exactly. Are there other questions that emerged for people to start with stakeholders rather than the end users? I'd love you to talk a little bit more about why that fits best for you in the order. Yeah, for sure. I think it's because they have the most generalized view of the project and everything like that, but it, it's also it's definitely in the software world, more important to know what our clients want from us before mm. we start going into talking to the end users. What are their goals, their thoughts? Because we generally want to know a wider variety of things, but they might not. So knowing what they are looking to hear or what they're focusing on before we talk to the end users makes a difference. Yeah, that sounds great. So I've got a comment here from Rosetti, who is going to give us, I think, the, the, the complaint we're going to hear from many people here. And so the comment is, I have stakeholders who still need to be convinced on the value of a feasibility study. We're currently at the point where we almost need to have a study on feasibility studies in order to convince them that it works for our organization. Do you have any tips on how we could improve stakeholder buy-in on feasibility studies in the first place? Because otherwise, yes, this is the terror of what if we're doing studies on studies? Oh, now I empathize with that so much, having clients and having stakeholders that just don't really quite mesh with the idea. I think, to be honest, something that we have done is just in 
plainer and plainer language and in shorter bursts, telling them why this matters and also giving them kind of evidence of it's hard. It, it can come across as I told you, but in business speak, however you want to put that, a phys feasibility study may have brought up some of the issues before we came across them. But yeah, it, especially if you have stakeholders that are, a lot of the time we find stakeholders are just so busy mm -hmm. that they don't, they're not able to hear you. Yeah. So sometimes it's repeating that message. And honestly, that's why I talk about the executive summary, just having your biggest finding the most impactful thing, mm -hmm. H1 biggest text at the top, <laughs> because sometimes they just open it and that's all they see. Yeah. And so. I think you talked a little bit about the value of having the external set of eyes, because sometimes the external consultant is new and you can put all their hope and dreams into them. And so suddenly the thing that you've been saying may not have been heard, but the outside consultant can say it. And suddenly it's her because it comes yeah. from a different voice in a different way. Yeah. And so looking at that, I'm really curious, say, have you seen useful, valuable internally created feasibility studies or would you really say it's more has more value coming from an external set of eyeballs like my knee-jerk reaction is it's always going to be better external it's always going to be just because honestly you need both the people who are doing the study and the stakeholders to be able to put aside their bias put aside, frankly, ego, which everybody has, it's really natural in order to hear from inside what may be going on. And so if the most effective way that will always be the most effective way is having it come from the outside. And otherwise it, it can be a real challenge. Yeah. And obviously there's people are sometimes not excited to buy into this process. It costs money. They're like, but I haven't, I'm not getting an output at the end. I'm getting an opinion. And so I'm wondering, have you worked with any organizations who maybe have also brought in like a, a skilled volunteer who has been able to lead these kinds of processes? Have you seen any examples around that approach? Yeah. Funnily enough, I was that person at some <laughs> point. I was volunteering for the Burnaby Citizens Association. They're a political group or basically, again, it, it can just be like, there's just not enough hands to make this process happen because it does take time and effort. But also something to put into people's minds is people who come out of certain degrees, like I came out of a UX design degree or any degree around an analysis or analytics might be looking for a project to do. And a project with a nonprofit group would be perfect, frankly. That is actually what I did. I came out of university. I did a project with them. It was a case study for my portfolio. I know everybody, I'm sure, is lacking in enough time, but an opportunity to get help like that might be through universities or posting on job applicant boards and things like right. that because people are looking for opportunities. Right, right. Yeah, and I think it's so true. So many of our nonprofits how between friends and families, very wide networks. We'd always be surprised to say, do you know someone who teaches a course on something like this? And yeah. they've been to put you in front of the right kind of people. No, exactly. Friend. I had a comment too, Lena, because I shared some stuff in the chat from the interviews that we did together, you and I, to prepare for this. And I can see that you've added a lot of content to this presentation, which was fantastic, fantastic when we last, when we first talked because it's almost two weeks ago. Um, I thought the example of the VC United and the United Way was interesting in many aspects, not least of which is the fact that we have a provincial election coming up. Um, but that's quite interesting to see that, that case study and people la put laughing emojis and technically exists as a political party. But no, I just wanted to commend you on all the content that you provided because it's very useful information. Oh, thank you so much. No, it's, uh, it's something that I'm really passionate about. And so I definitely know if someone asks me about it, it's been me like holding back and like too much information out of <laughs> too much. <laughs> thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, it's an interesting much. topic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually that example, I really like because it takes us out of just the software or even project world to say, yeah. let's not put a marketing project. 
what's the feasibility on this? And to Ben's point, maybe things, the feasibility study had some skip steps and ended up in a little bit of a political snap. So I think it's an interesting example of why that more methodical approach can save you tears later. Exactly. Then, thank you. I'm going to join Sandra in the comments. He says, thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. I'm here on that one. And so I just want to thank you so much for coming and sharing this and all these great links, which I will include in the post event email as well.